Cross Life Broadcasting Taking the Gospel Around the World um, I want to talk to you today, the Lord willing, about hell. I feel his presence. Because in our postmodern world, there's a lot of problems that man has because his sensibilities are offended at the thought that we, that an, a finite amount of sin can lead to an infinite damnation. This offense, offense of sensibilities has led theologians to try to come up with all sorts of solutions to the problem. These solutions are, there are many today that are even saying that there is no hell. There are some that are saying that hell is real, but it's only a temporary thing. And there are different views within that, that some would say that it's a purgatory that you go to for a period of time and pay for your sins and then you get to go to heaven and others will believe in universalism that all men will eventually be saved and then there are those that believe in annihilation that do not believe in a permanent eternal suffering in hell but they believe that we will be burnt up and just cease to exist the real problem, the problem with these solutions is we have started with the offended sensibilities of carnal man and trying to bend the word of God to be more, uh, to be more palatable to our offended sensibilities when really the truth is we should realize that carnal fallen man will always be offended at the truth and that we should fight it from scripture alone. Now some preachers. And I don't preach on it all the time. For this reason. Think that it's wrong to preach on hell. Because we think that we're trying to just. Bow, bow, brow beat or scare people. Into salvation. The critique is that scaring somebody to salvation creates a false conversion. But can I tell you that there are just as many false conversions from a seeker-friendly gospel as there are from a gospel telling the truth about hell. But the fact is, I'm not here to try to scare you this morning, but Jude says in 1, 22 and 23, And of some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by flesh. I go to Acts chapter 19 when the seven sons of Savior decided that they wanted to cast out devils and how when they went to cast out a devil that the demon spirit said to him Jesus I know Paul I know but who are you and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them and they fled out of the house naked and wounded but here's the key and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So I do you a disservice when I do not preach to you about hell. My job is not to scare you. However, this morning it's to persuade you of Christ. To persuade you of eternal life. Juxtaposed against the opposite. Part of the confusion and the different doctrines of hell come from a problem within the King James Version where no, even though there are different words employed in the original language, the King James translates them all as the same word as hell. But we have in the Hebrew a word of Sheol. Sheol is the abode of the dead. It is a subterranean pit. The inhabitants are prisoners and inmates. It is also used on occasion to talk about the grave. 
But the problem is there are different levels of Sheol. There is the grave and there are different depths and levels that go even deeper. The psalmist says in 86.13 that you have delivered my soul from the lowest part of Sheol. Now another word that Jesus uses is Gehenna. This, and we'll talk about this in a moment, is the Valley of Hinnom, where filth and rubbish was burned continually, and Christ uses it as an example of hell. Then we have the Greek, another Greek word, which is the equivalent to Sheol, and it's Hades. And it's used to describe the grave, death, the abode of the dead. Some of you are probably familiar with Greek mythology and Hades being the god of the underworld and, and, uh, and, the place, and Hades being the place of the dead. There, there's a lot of similarities there and obviously we don't go to Greek mythology but there is a reason why that Greek word Hades is used in the Bible because it's the abode of the dead. There's another word that is used one time in Second Peter, Tartaro, and it means the deepest abyss of Hades, where fallen angels were cast and bound in chains of darkness until judgment. Hell, Hades, Sheol, is the abode of the dead. You need to know that the body was not created to live forever. The spirit is he, of man is eternal because it is made from the divine breath of God that God formed us from the dust of the ground and then he breathed the breath of life into man and he became a living soul. Immortality of the body is conditionally bestowed. Now don't misunderstand me. There are some that talk about conditional immortality not to the point of annihilation. That's not what we're talking about. But what I'm telling you is that your immortality of the body has always been conditioned on your obedience to God. God formed man in the Garden of Eden and He gave him the tree of life. That by the eating of the tree of life, eating of the fruit of the tree of life, man could live forever. When man fell, God said, we've got to get him out of the garden unless so that he cannot reach forth his hand and partake of the tree of life and live forever in this ungodly, sinful state. The tree of life was the gift of God that bestowed eternal life for the body. But it was contingent upon obedience. We die now. When we die, which is the result of sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. No matter who we are today, should the Lord tarry long enough or some tragedy bestow us, we all will breathe our last breath and we all will pass from life into the abode of the dead. Let me rephrase that. We all will die. We cannot be in the presence of God without the atonement of sin. Atonement comes by death and by the shedding of blood. And so until there was a way to atone and live, all, all men, both righteous and wicked, went to the abode of the dead. They went to the grave and to the deeper prison in the, of the dead and became inmates of Hades and Sheol. Proverbs 1 and 12 says that I go down, that I, when I die, it's as though I go down into the pit. I'm a, in that word pit in the original Hebrew, it's talking about a prison, a dungeon. Now the Jews, in the early books of the, New, of the Old Testament, in the early years of their existence, did not believe in an afterlife. They, for the most part, even by the time of around David, they believed that when you died, that was it. You went to the abode of the dead and that there was no resurrection. At some point in time, the idea began to advance and something that we call progressive revelation 
I believe that, let me under, teach you progressive revelation, that we today have a better understanding of Scripture in hindsight than people 2,000 years ago. Does that make sense? Per God, progressive revelation is not... It cannot contradict what has already been revealed. By the time of Christ, we realize that there are two parts of hell. And some people will say, well, we just made that up. That's just an invention. Well, no, we could say that. Except this is the words of Christ himself. That there were two parts of Hades. Number one was a place of torment. A place of tormented and flames where there was no water and we were grieved and weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the other one was called paradise or Abraham's bosom and it's where the righteous dead would go. It was still a prison but it was where the righteous went. And they were not tormented by the flames. There was a great gulf. Depending on how you look at the language, a great gulf or a great river that ran between the two that you could not pass between. It kind of ties in with Greek mythology, if you're familiar with that. That, that there was a ferryman, the Sharon in the Greek mythology that would ferry people across this river to the abode of the dead. Well, it's kind of that same idea that in, in the words of Christ, except Christ replaces Sharon, the ferryman, with an angel and you'll see that in a moment but they would that the angels would bear us across the gulf the righteous across the goat to paradise Abraham's bosom to a place of comfort and rest but still separated from God in Luke 16 verse 19 it says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. Being tortured and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. But Abraham, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. And cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth not thy good things. Receiveth thy good things, and likewise eat Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf. Fix so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us, but they would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, where I have my brother, and that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, Thou hast Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So the words of Christ, which bear greater authority than any other theory of man, when Christ came, he died on the cross. He shed his blood and paid with his life, paid for the atonement of our sins. He went down, he descended both into the grave and to the deeper abode of the dead. He went to Abraham's bosom. He went to paradise. He did not burn in hell as some teach. That's a heresy. But he went to paradise, Abraham's bosom. And on the third day, what happened? He rose again. 
And he rose with the keys of the abode of the dead and death itself. He became the first fruits of them which sleep in Christ. So that because Jesus, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, will one that lives on the inside of you and I, will one day raise us up from the dead. We can be sure of that. Now hopefully very soon before we go by the grave, the trump of God will sound and the dead will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be called up to meet the Lord in the air. But isn't it a comforting thing to know that if I go by the grave, that one day ain't no grave going to hold that body down. And the grave and the body will come up. Abraham's bosom is empty today. Christ led those that were captive to freedom. He led captivity. Captive, O grave, where is thy sting? O death, where is thy victory? They, the Paul says that today when we die, when we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our substitutionary sacrifice, I'm saved that we'll be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. But that's only for those that have had their sins washed by the blood of Jesus. Only those that have been saved and believed on the Son of God. For the wicked, their destination is still the abode of the dead. The life is eternal. Christ said, I come that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. But just as eternal life in Christ is eternal. The separation from Christ is also eternal. If I could pay for my sins by burning in hell for a thousand years and then go to heaven, if I could do it that way, there was no point for Christ to come. If I could be saved regardless of how I live, if I could be saved regardless of whom, what God I believe in, then Christ was a liar when he said, I am the only way, the truth and the life, that no man can come to the Father but by me. But just as life in Christ is eternal, death unto sin unto death is also eternal. But can I tell you, and I don't want to confuse you, hang on to this. Sheol and Hades are a temporary place. The abode of the dead is temporary. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But when we go to the words of Christ, one of the words that Christ used when he talked about hell where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the fire is not quenched, where the worm, the skin worm dieth not. He used the word Gehenna in the Greek. Gehenna was talking about the valley of Hinnom. It was a valley that was to the south of Jerusalem. And it was a valley where all of the waste and all of the refuge and all of the sewage and dead animals of the city would be taken and it would be burned. They didn't have dumps like we have them today. They didn't have recycling like we have them today. They didn't have sewer systems and water treatment plants like we have today. It all went to the valley of Hinnom. Can you imagine the stench that was there? The stench that was made worth by a fire that always was burning. That never went out. The stench that would be raised up into the air. Christ, when he talks about hell, talks about this place of refuge. Talks about the place that the fire is not quenched. Talks about this place as outer darkness. Yes, it was a literal valley, but Christ uses it to talk about hell. 
I told you just a moment ago that Sheol, the Hades, the abode of the dead, are but temporary places. And you might be saying, but preacher, you just said a few minutes ago that hell is eternal. How can Hades be temporary, but hell be eternal? Remember, it's important to know what the words are talking about, what words that are being used. We see in the book of Revelation, chapter number 20, verse number 10 through 15, that the wicked dead, those that have not believed in Christ. You know, a minute ago I talked about the rapture, the resurrection of the righteous, that when the trump of God shall sound, we're going to get up out of the ground and we're going to be with God in heaven forever. I'm looking forward to that day. But it says in the book of Revelation that at that point the wicked dead are not raised to life. But at the end of time, after everything, on the, fact, the very last day of time itself, Christ will raise the wicked dead it says in verse number 10 of chapter 20 and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beasts and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man According to their works. Get this. And death and hell. Death and Hades. The abode of the dead. Are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life. Was cast into the lake of fire. 2 Peter 2 and 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Matthew 13 and 40, and therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of God, man, shall send forth his angels and they shall gather up his kingdom, all things that offend and them which do iniquity and cast them into a furnace of fire. And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. In 2 Timothy 4 and 1, it talks about he judges both the living and the dead. That word, in fact, it says the quick and the dead, but the word quick means living. What I wanted you to see is that the lake of fire, the Bible calls it the second death. It is the place of eternal punishment. I, there are individuals that don't believe in this, and that's okay. I, I hope that they never find out otherwise. But there are people that believe that there's not people that are in hell today. Can I tell you, by the words of Christ Himself, there are people that are in hell today that have died without God, that have died without His Son, that have died without His substitutionary sacrifice washing away their sins. And they're crying out in torment today. But as bad as that is, as bad as that is, it does not compare to the lake of fire, which is the second death. That word, when it talks about it, it's talking about an ongoing thing. We don't burn up and then we're done. It talks about an ongoing, it's in the aorist, uh, it's in the aorist tense and it's in the uh, uh, I forgot on the top of my head but it's in the aorist tense and it's in a, in a certain mood and it talks about how it is something that is ongoing that, ne that never ends, that never quits so for eternity we will be perishing and dying without Christ just as in Christ we have eternal life Outside of Christ, we have eternal death. Jesus says something that we quote a lot. That on this rock, he's going to build his church and the gates of hell 
shall not prevail against it. I want to take you now to where that took place, to Caesarea Philippi. Right outside of Caesarea Philippi, Christ is with his disciples. They've come back from ministering and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he says, who do the people say that I am? Some people say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Isaiah. Some say that you are, uh, that you are I, I, Elijah. Some say these things. And Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, I believe you're the son of God. The Christ. The one sent. Of God to vanquish sin. You're the Messiah. And Jesus, we believe it was the confession he was talking about, said Simon Barjona. Simon, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Did you know that you can't be saved unless the Father draw you to him? And you can't come to the Father but through Jesus. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church upon this confession. You're the Christ. Alan, if you can do something for me, I know that I'm getting ready to probably run out of tape on the camera. If you on the live stream software will hit stop, start recording. Not stop, start recording. In the area of Caesarea Philippi, there was a great wall, a cliffside. That had the mouth of a cave. It's still there. Out of the mouth of the cave. There used to be a spring of still water. That would run out from the cave. And feed the, the pools. That would be used for the idol worship. Literally that cave. Which an earthquake has collapsed it. In a large portion today. But that cave back then was called the jaws of death. The gates of hell. And carved into the side of this, there was a great temple complex for this worship. Carved into the side in different niches uh, was little alcoves. And there were wooden, wooden statues of the god Pan. And the god Pan was the, the, in Greek mythology, was the god of the shepherds. And so this half goat, half man individual that played the flute was there in the God of the shepherds. This idol worship at the gates of hell carved into a large cliffside rock. That it was in that area. Perhaps Jesus, we don't know for sure, but perhaps Jesus was looking at it and pointed to it. When he said, upon this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell, the jaws of death will not prevail against it. He said the abode of the dead will not prevail against the kingdom of life. That sin brought death into the world. But by the death of Christ, sin was paid for. And we have life and life more abundantly. When you belong to Christ, you belong to a kingdom of life that death and hell cannot touch and cannot conquer. Amen. The kingdom of life. Sin. Death itself was defeated by Christ. You can come into the kingdom of the living only by Christ. Kind of helps us to understand things the scripture says in a different light, doesn't it? That we serve God unto righteous, righteousness unto life, eternal life, and sin unto death. God, no matter who you are today... Whom he foreknew, he also did predestine, and he called according to his purposes. 
I don't believe that you're here by accident. You may have walked in here by accident today, but I don't believe that you're here by accident. I believe that God called you, ordained you. He foreknew you he, before you were even a fault in your father and mother's minds. God knew you. He has a place for you in his kingdom. He wants to call you out of the abode of the dead. And bring you into the kingdom of the living. See, it's not just about us escaping the fires of hell. And a couple of weeks ago, maybe even last week, they sang a special. I escaped that awful place when Jesus saved my soul. Not one hair upon my head to that place will go. And I don't have to worry for the Savior took my part. The only fire I'll ever feel is burning in my heart. Listen, I don't want you to get saved just because you don't want to burn in hell. But you need to know that I want you to get saved because you want to be a part of the kingdom of life. Because you want to be brought into the fullness of what God has for you. But you have to know that if I do not serve the Lord, if I do not obey Him... If I do not hearken unto his word and obey his will, that Christ cannot deliver us from the abode of the dead. He has provided one way and one way alone of escape. And it's a way of life. It's a way of righteousness can't just say, God, get me out of hell and then let me live any way that I want to live. That when you're saved and he gives you the Holy Spirit, that it will be evidenced by the works in your life. If someone could come to the piano, please. Jesus has provided only one way of escape. Hang on just one second, sister. One way. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he said. I can't come. There, there, there's an old story of Pilgrim's Progress. Of individuals that were on their way to heaven and they took a shortcut. And the main character Christian says, did you come by way of the cross? And they said, no, we didn't come by that. We went a different way. We took a shortcut. Can I tell you? There's only one way. It's by the cross. And when I come to Christ, I'm dying to sin. Well, over the past several weeks, we've had many people saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm thankful for that. But the Holy Ghost, he even said it. He's crying out yes, he is. to somebody or some peoples. I don't know. I say it every time. I wish I knew who it was so that I could come and get you. But he has called you out of sin. Stop doing what you're doing. There are two ways. There's a way of life and a way of death. But without holiness, no man shall see God. And I obey the Holy Ghost this morning. Let me paraphrase because I don't have it before me. But you can look it up. I've preached it many times. For those who commit sexual sins... Those that commit adultery, drunkards, revelers, idolaters, homosexuals, effeminate men, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, such shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you're doing those things, I'm telling you right now, 
It's not, it's not up to me. And we can't say, well, God's going to make an exception for me. I'm telling you right now, such have no part in the kingdom of life. you believe in him if you'll come forward and die to your sins today you can leave singing I escaped that awful place when Jesus saved my soul not one hair upon my head to that place will go and I don't have to worry for the Savior took my part. And the only fire I'll ever feel is burning in my heart. Yes. Sister Dusky, play softly. Listen, I've done all I can do today. I, pre I even ended up preaching this message in a different way than I intended. Because I feel the grief of God. I feel the unction of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit normally does things. He's not bound to this. I'm just telling you what He normally does here. The normal acts of operation is the Word is then preached. And then the Holy Spirit, when He does speak, speaks at the end of it and confirms the Word. But this message today was of such importance. Even when the Spirit was moving, I even thought, well, maybe I'm not going to preach this today. But the message was of such importance. The Holy Spirit spoke to you first and said, this is for you. I know that by doing it this way, it makes it more difficult. A lot of preachers, and I've done it, will say, if you want to be saved, everybody bow your head and close your eyes. And if you want to be saved, raise your hand. I've even said it a hundred times. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to do nothing crazy to you. Listen, the Bible says that if I deny him before me and I, he'll deny me before the Father. If we're not ready to publicly proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not ready to believe in Him and be saved. So I'm going to ask you to do something as we stand all over the house. If the Lord has spoken to you today, the Holy Spirit has tugged on your heart, please don't break the heart of this preacher. But more importantly, don't break the heart of God. Please, would you respond and come forward? Because there's nobody here that's going to think bad of you. And if they do, they're the ones that need to be up here too. But we're a family. We're the body of Christ. We're going to rejoice with you. Whether you're being saved for the first time or you need to rededicate your heart to the Lord. I'm not talking about you making a mistake and, and, and you don't lose your salvation because you make a mistake. I'm not talking about that. But you know right now in your heart the Spirit's bearing witness with you. Whether if you died today, whether you'd go to the kingdom of the living or to the abode of the dead, you know that. And it's manifested by the works in your life. If you need somebody to come for, to go with you, you take them by the hand and they'll come with you to the altar. Would you please come? I'm going to pray. I refuse to believe that this message was in vain today. Ultimately, it's not the words of this preacher, but it's the cries of the Holy Ghost that you reject when you do not respond. If you came forward at the beginning of the service and prayed in the altar, then that's fine. Come up here and, and come up here again because I want to pray with you. I want to know that. But I'm going to pray and would you come right now?
In Jesus' name, come, come. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray. I've done everything that I can do, oh God. I've preached your word to the best that I can preach it. God, you said with some have compassion, with some with fear. Pull them out of the fires of hell. God, unto salvation, Lord, that there not one of us here today leave this place bound for that abode of the death. For those in Christ, I prevail. Would you please, Lord? Set at liberty, God, their feet to move. God, I, I don't know if I I don't know if I believe in the doctrine of uh, uh, of irresistible grace or not, God, but please, Lord Jesus, if it be true, Lord, convict somebody's heart to the point that they cannot resist. For whom you did foreknow. You did predestine. God, that scripture's in my heart, Lord. For whom you did foreknow, you did predestinate and call according unto your purposes. Not for the purpose.